Okay. Howdy, addicts. Well, welcome, welcome to the to this week's Monday lunch. I'd like to, uh, if y'all could, uh, I'd like to welcome up John Kimbrough, who has been out for a couple months. It seems like glad to have you back, John. You got a story for us? Do you have a story for us? You know, back in the old days, at and m start our yell practices with a fable. So I got a little fable for you here. Back in uh, Tennessee, about 68 miles east, they all owned the store, and he uh, there on the square of Woodbury. He was one of the last of the old southern gentlemen, but he had, did have one vice. He loved to play the ponies. So this year he's going to go to New Orleans and play the ponies, and he goes over to New Orleans, bet on the ponies, and lost his money. Well, the people there said, hey, that's okay. We'll take your check. You can write a check, and we'll, we'll take it. So he wrote some checks, lost that money. So he goes back to Woodbury, Tennessee, <laughs> laughing all the way. He says, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the bank and I'm going to stop payment on all these checks. <laughs> so he stopped payment on all those checks. About two weeks later, big black long limousine rolls into Woodbury. Two guys up in the front seat looked like Al Capone. Went to the grocery store, says, Mr. Joe Hall here? No, he's up at his farm today. Doing a little work. Where's his farm? Is it up on Creek Hill Road? <clears throat> so they start up there and up this old dirt road and they see this boy. Summertime, he's home from school helping his daddy. He got the mule out in a cornfield. They roll up and pull, pull up next to the fence, four strands of barbed wire on the post. Hey, boy! He said, You talking to me? Yeah, I'm talking to you. Mr. Joe Hall live up here? He said, I don't know. The guy said, well, you corn rows are awful curvy. He said, you can grow as much corn on a curb row as you can a straight one. He said, well, your corn is looking mighty yellow. He said, well, it should. We planted yellow corn. He said, boy, there ain't much between you and a pure damn fool, is there? He said, just this fence right here. <laughs> About that time, the boy's daddy came out of the barn. He was called you. He was going to work. Oh, God help me. Hey, old man, you talking to me? Yeah, he said, where does Mr. Joe Hall live? He said, I don't know. Wouldn't tell you if I did. Oh, you don't know where Mr. Hall is? Do you know how to dance? Let's see if you can dance. He pulled a sub nose 38 out of his vest pocket and he said, bang. The old man jumped and the dust flew. Bang, bang. He was jumping some more. Bang, bang, bang. The old man was counting. Uh-huh. That's the last shot. He went around on the other side of his mule and he grabbed a shotgun. Double barrel, sawed off, 12-gauge shotgun that he carried on a rack he'd made over there to shoot birds in his car. He grabbed that off of that hook and he walked around and jumped over that fence. And he took that, that shotgun and took both barrels and stuck it right above that guy's chin. Bent him over backwards over the hood of his car. Now, Mr. Wise guy, gambling man from New Orleans. Then he thumb cocked that shotgun. He said, have you ever had the privilege of kissing a 1,500 pound, green lip, bad breath mule right in the mouth? The old fellow realized he doesn't quite it in the pretty deep water. He said, no, sir, but I've always wanted to. <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> Loving Heavenly Father, we pray to you today, giving thanks for the blessings you've given us and asking you to heal our country. Father, only you can do what has to be done in these troubled times. We beg you, help our country. And Father, we ask you to bless us and to bless Texas A&M. Bless all of us 
And in this pandemic we're in, the people I think are abusing us. And in your name we pray all this. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas one state under God. Well, thank you very much for that, Mr. Kimbrough. You've been uh, we've been missing that over the last few months. All right, we've got uh, unfortunately we've got some some silver taps this week. Uh, I'm just going to read a post from uh, the Commandant. Uh, it, it says, uh, it is with extreme sadness that I confirm the death of Cadet Ryan Bowles, class of 24, member of the Corps of Cadets. Ryan was a freshman political science major from Bernie. I hope the Bowles family takes solace in knowing Ryan will never be forgotten. That's the, the uh, only silver tap that I've got this week. Um, so if you'll take a second for a moment of silence, please. All right. Do we uh, do we have any new members or guests here with us this week? Uh, uh, Mr. Lay, did you bring any any new guests? Here's my daughter, class of '88. Cynthia. <laughs> Cynthia, thank you for coming and joining us. I uh, hope everybody's enjoying their uh, Circle G barbecue from David Gerke. Yeah. Another another great meal. And, uh, and for dessert, we've got the Aggie Women's Club in the back with their homemade pies, so go grab you one. Uh, Aggie Athletics, our Aggie women are still, uh, they've only got one loss on the season. They're 16-1. and one. They play February 4th against LSU. And then the Aggie men's are 8-7, and seven, uh, but they, they beat K-State in the uh, SEC Big 12 uh, competition that they had. And a couple of SEC teams had to play each other because Big 12's only got 10 teams. Uh, and then Aggie women's tennis, big winners last week. So uh, Aggie athletics looking pretty good. We've got, let's see, our capital campaign. We're at 1.3 million. So we're still working towards that, uh, our final goal of 1.6. And we've got, uh, everyone, please remember, we've got the uh, 100th anniversary uh, Aggie swag gear up here, hats, shirts, and uh, some other stuff that we'll be rolling out throughout the year so that you can uh, impress all your friends with the, with the great Aggie Park gear that we've got. We've got the Aggie Golf Classic coming up March 19th, so sign up a team if you haven't or if you just would like to be part of it. There's plenty of opportunities to sponsor or to volunteer the day of. Um, and during the golf tournament, we've got a uh, $10 raffle ticket for a two-night stay and four rounds of golf at uh, JW Marriott. I believe we've still got 2020 medals, guys, so $10. <laughs> we might start doing We might start doing two for 10. Uh, we'll, see, we'll see when we get there. A uh, couple other announcements. If you all seen outside, the, uh, the work being done at the front of the park. We've got uh, the Aggies, the uh, monument sign going up, and Donna Miller's here with us. Her and her husband are, are helping us out big time, getting making sure that thing gets put up correctly and for the right price. Um, we've had a couple other uh, Aggie-owned companies that are donate that have donated some services as well. Uh, Ingram Ready Mix has donated the concrete, and AH Beck uh, drilled those holes in the ground to put those posts. So a lot of help from uh, the from the Aggie family, which is what we like to see. So now, now I'd like to call up our vice president, Reagan Freiling, so he can talk about Monday lunch and uh, upcoming events. Thanks, Reagan. Howdy. 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 
I saw my slide up there and I thought Logan was going to introduce all my speakers. So thank you for pulling off Logan. Uh, it's great to see everybody again today. Uh, we were scheduled to have a representative from the stock show uh, rodeo and they kind of pulled off all of their speaking engagements for now. And so I've got to tell you, my first call was this young lady that's here. Um, you might recognize the last name Holmes. Uh, the Holmes family is very integral here at Aggie Park, uh, valuable members of our club. And so you guys are in for a treat today. So Renee Holmes, class of 16, is here. She's working on her PhD in entomology. Uh, she graduated here in San Antonio from Johnson High School in 2012. And then she went to AM. She was active in the AM Horsemen's Association. She's earned her a Bachelor of Science in Entomology and a Master's of Science in Veterinarian, Veterinarian, I can't even say it, Veterinarian, Veterinarian Public Health. Health. I'm doing good to say Entomology, how's that? Yeah, in epidemiology. And so now straight from College Station, I've got Renee Holmes. Come on up, Renee. Okay, and so before she gets up here, um, She's a, she's a bug girl, right? So she loves bugs, and she, uh, her mom says she always has. But uh, can you you know the difference? Can you tell the difference, the gender of an ant? How you tell the difference by dropping an ant in water? Okay, if it sinks, it's a girl. If it floats, it's boy. Uh, get it? Get it? Okay. Okay. And then one other. What do you call an old ant? An antique. Okay, that's enough. Okay. Now you all will enjoy having Renee's. Yeah, you're, you're right. done. You're done. Yeah. Go away. <laughs> okay. So do I just like click it one to the side? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh wait, you're still ducking the one. And Renee, you can tell he was an ag ego major. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, that's probably the move. Okay. That's your slides. Stand by. Oh, that's right. This mouse doesn't work. I'm sorry, guys. One second. Oh, there we go. Okay. Ah. Okay, so apologies in advance. This was a little bit of a last second invite, but um, this was my talk for the national conference. Um, it, um, well, actually this year it was at home. It was supposed to be in Florida. It would have been really cool if this world is there. Um, but yeah, so if anything on my slides is directed at the national conference, just pretend you're the national conference. Okay, so, um, the, this is one of my dissertation chapters. This is my first dissertation chapter. Um, I'm studying fire ants, obviously, and specifically um, a series of viruses that could potentially be used as a biological control agent. And my entire dissertation is focused around um, the, making the case for Solenopsis invictiviruses, which I'm just going to call CINV after this, as potential biological control agents. And I'm working on some methodologies uh, to potentially use those in the future to control fire ants. So, the title of my talk is Solenopsis Invictiviruses, Interactions with the Host, the Red Imported Fire Ant, Solenopsis Invictivirin, and that is a whole lot of words for fire ant viruses and fire ants. So, I feel like I probably don't need to give you all a whole lot of background because everybody knows and hates fire ants, um, but as just some background information. Fire ants are not actually supposed to be in the United States in any capacity. They're not North American ants. Um, they're invasive and they're from South America and specifically Argentina. So they are, because they don't have any true natural enemies in our area, they are exceptionally difficult to control. And ants just as a general genera are exceptionally challenging to control because they are extremely adaptive little buggers. They're so good at making themselves at home in any place that they colonize. So currently, just some statistics on fire ants, they have invaded 130 million hectares of range since their original introduction in around 1920. And there's a lot of argument 
on when they were introduced. It's somewhere between 1910 and 1930, depending on who you ask. But in the course of about 100 years, 138 million hectares of land, that's a lot. So they cause problems in the veterinary, medical, agricultural, social, commercial, and ecological areas of interest. And they, it's also incredibly difficult to put a value to the amount of damage that's been done by fire ants because things like ecological issues, so the different species that they have killed off as a result of invading this area, it's not something that we can put a monetary value to, but just the quantifiable amount of money that's in damages that's been caused is around six million and uh, six billion dollars in damages to the U.S. annually, with 1.2 billion dollars of those damages done in Texas. We love fire ants here, <laughs> and again, they are like other invasive ants, exceptionally challenging to control. So control efforts have a long and storied past. Um, there is a long history of control efforts that are specifically based in chemicals. So our ambros and things like that, which are actually exceptionally um, efficient and very, they're very good at controlling fire ants. Um, but current and historic efforts have been largely pesticide and chemical mediated and thousands of different bait formulations have been used. But the issue with using baits and uh, pesticides and toxins in general is that they, again, because of the biology of fire ants, they're tough. And also, whenever you use a bait formulation or any kind of toxin formulation, it's challenging because you're not, you have no guarantee that the guy that you want to kill is actually going to be who consumes or is exposed to that, that bait, to that toxin. And so you end up with off-target effects, you kill other species, and there's also this really fun little asterisk next to controlling fire ants that if you don't kill the queen, if you kill off all of the workers, she doesn't care. It takes her a very short amount of time to replace the lost workers that were killed as a result of your bait. So that's a huge bummer and you don't kill your ants and you spend all of the money on the ant drone that doesn't actually get the job done. So this is an applicable quote that is absolutely not what Sun Tzu was talking about when he wrote it. If you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the results of a hundred battles. But if you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. And again, that is not about fire ants, but it seems like it fits, so I put it in. So that moves us into biological control efforts. So biological controls have really become an area of study and of interest because we love the idea of using something that is a naturally occurring enemy of the bad guy to control the bad guy. There's some different stories on why this is successful and why this is not so successful, but the typical control efforts that are associated with uh, imported fire ants include pathogens, predators, parasites, pheromones, which are um, their signaling devices that ants use, uh, and sterilization and genetic manipulation. So we're not gonna get into the genetic manipulation and sterilization or really pheromones of these other guys. Um, but some of the predators that have been used, one of them is fire ant decapitating forage, which is a really cool little fly that lays an egg in the base of a fire ant worker's head. And then as the larva grows, it pops the fire ant's head off. <laughs> and it's really cool. But again, know what I'm talking about. I just think they're cool. Um, and then we move on to intima pathogens, which is my area of study. And some of these include Pseudomonas, which is a, another biological control agent, um, the fungi Bavaria bassiana, Metaresium anisfile, Aspergillus flavus, just some different big words to say natural enemies of fire ants. And Pseudomonas were really cool. At one point, um, they were extremely promising because they resulted in very high toxicity with 100% colony mortality within five days in laboratory studies. But then the very sad bummer and reality of biological control agents in the field, nothing happened. Bummer. But moving on to that, moving on to my area, viruses, these guys look really promising. So if you look to the left, or my right, your left, um, this is an electron micrograph stain of purified Solenopsis invictivirus 3, which is a, an intima pathogen. It is a pathogen of Solenopsis invicta of the red and fire. And it's what we're going to be talking about today. So, 
Somopsis and Victor viruses. Um, these are, this is a whole lot about the anatomy of viruses, um, but they are positive sense single stranded RNA viruses. So they are somewhat similar to coronavirus in that it is an RNA virus. Um, and they were originally placed in another family that is not really worth talking about with y'all. Um, but they have their own new viral family, which is kind of the whole point. Um, but they have their, their own new cool family called Solenvaviridae, named for Solenopsis invicta. So they are in the, the important piece of information is that they have their own family now. And these are cool. So they're relatively small viruses as far as their genome sequence, but they cause both chronic and epidemic disease outcomes. So Solenopsis invicta virus 1, which is one strain of the virus, causes this chronic infection type where unless they're under severe stress, they really don't have any visible disease outcome except for some reduction in the amount of brood or the immatures that are present in the colony. Whereas Solenopsis and virus 3 has this epidemic disease outcome where when a colony is infected with it, it's very rapid decline of the colony. So um, these are present in the United States. Um, there have not been extensive studies as far as um, the prevalence of Solenopsis and viruses in the United States, with the United States, which is the whole point of this dissertation chapter of mine. Um, but chronic uh, infections of other Solenopsis and viruses are relatively common, and I have sampled Solenopsis and virus one in Texas sites pretty extensively, and I'll show you all that data in just a minute. Whereas, not surprisingly, our epidemic disease outcome virus, Solenopsis and virus three, is much less common in Texas, which makes a lot of sense. If something's really nasty and deadly, it's probably not going to be out and about very much. We don't have Ebola bouncing around among our populations because we tend to die a lot from it. Same thing with these guys. So for Solenopsis and virus 3, which is again our epidemic disease outcome virus, um, in Florida, studies have resulted in um, prevalence that is relatively similar to that of native Argentina, with about 10.8% in Gainesville, Florida as our prevalence, and in Argentina, it's around 9.6% prevalence. So, however, again, this data has not been collected for Texas. So that's what I've been doing. And so despite their de despite detection, the relationship between SIMB1 and SIMB3 and its host has yet to be extensively studied in Texas. So the whole objective of this chapter and of this talk is to describe the presence seasonal variation and prevalence of Solenopsis and viruses one and three in fire ant colonies in the College Station area specifically for future comparison of Texas to data from Florida and Argentina in order to, to detect and recognize statistically significant differences across those locations. So that's a really long sentence to say, I'm just comparing data from three different locations to see what I see. So in order to accomplish this, um, I've been sampling seven different sites in the Bryan College Station area. So two of them are in College Station, Texas, four are in Bryan, and one is in Hearn. And this is one of my collection sites. This guy's a character. It, one of my collection sites, so he doesn't really have great phone access. <laughs> so when I first met these guys, um, I have seven different places that I have, they're all private properties that I've gotten access to. And uh, so this guy, Brett, he lives in the middle of the boonies. And so I go out to his house and it has this tiny little gate that my truck's not that big and I could barely get through this thing. And so he's got, he wasn't answering the phone and the signs, he has a, like a five mile driveway and these kind of signs are all the way up and down. And I'm like, is this really going to be how I go out? Is this the end for me? They're never going to find me. So anywho, just added that in because I thought that would be fun for y'all to see that. So anywho, like I say, two collection sites in College Station, four in Bryan and one in Hearn. And I do these collections monthly so that I can get a feel for the seasonal variation between um, each one of the collection sites on a monthly basis. And so I collect large, easily visible mounds, a minimum of 50 feet apart, so that I don't end up collecting the same colony multiple times. Because colonies are not, when you see a mound of fire ants, that's not one colony, right? So colonies typically are polygiants that have multiple queens, and they're extensive. They can be very large. And so they'll be connected underground. You'll have a mound, and then you'll have 
tunnels and connections and another mountain. And they're all part of the same colony system. So I like to spread out as much as I can so I don't inadvertently sample the same colony twice. And so I collect 10 mounds from each study site where you record, record exact coordinates and then separate the ants by cast and store them at minus 80 degrees Celsius. So this is a map of the different locations that I'm sampling and the, the uh, names with the exception of Millican Reserve are all associated with the different uh, people who own the properties. So if you're familiar with Millican Reserve, you can see kind of how spread out each one of these are. They're, basically up and down Highway 6, and Mr. Weiser, that top right-hand guy, is just all the way out in Canada. <laughs> so, in order to identify infection, um, yell at me, raise your hand if this doesn't make any sense, just scream at me. So, what I do is, there is a chemical reaction called RNA extraction. So, I basically stick the frozen ants in a tube and grind them into a powder, and use a phenol chloroform solution to release their total nucleic acids, so their DNAs and their RNAs. And then I use a cDNA, so complementary DNA synthesis kit, to make a copy of all of those RNAs. And then I make a whole bunch of copies of those copies. And then I use a what's called a gel electrophoresis kit that you've seen on the OJ trial. That is the way to describe it, as it was the little lines that were seen on the OJ trial. And Based on the size of the band of the line that I see, that tells me, based on a sequence, how big the, the uh, band of nucleic acids is. And so that tells me, based on the primers that I use, there's a specific length that I'm looking for. And so I can compare that specific length to my known viral length, and I can tell whether or not there is a positive or a negative colony. So that's how I do it. And that's called PCR, which I thought I was funny with my little pipette cry repeats, kind of a nerd joke. <laughs> Feel free to laugh if you think it's funny. If not, just humor me. Okay, so this is the good stuff. So this is the data that I've collected to date. So this is the monthly prevalence for Solnopsis Invictivirus 1, and this is by location. So this is really interesting. The biggest takeaway, instead of getting kind of bogged down in the data, the biggest takeaway here is that there's a huge amount of heterogeneity, meaning there is a huge amount of variation in between each one of these locations. So at my Venable location, which is, again, these are last names, I have, in January, I have 70% prevalence, whereas in April, I have 80% prevalence, and then it drops down to 20. And it's bouncing all over the place, and that's the same case. Then you go over here to Mr. McCulley's place, the guy with the weird signs that's here again. You go to Mr. McCulley's place, and I have 50% prevalence in January, and then pretty much nothing from there on out. And the big asterisk to kind of take away from not only this data, but from when it's occurring, when these high prevalences are occurring, is that in Florida, this is generally a spring-related virus. So the highest prevalence is typically detected between March and May. What? So that's really cool. That, that says that Texas is different from our Florida locations for, at the very least, Solnopsis invictivirus 1. And again, this is my more chronic type uh, disease outcome. So another thing that's kind of interesting <coughs> is that we're going to see a big difference at this venable location. So this guy's property is under construction. Fire ants are generally known as being disturbance colonizers, so they really like it when the ground is really turned up. So he started construction in April. So he's got a whole lot of fire ant virus in April, this bar right here. And then when the disturbance happens, it just drops off. So that's kind of an interesting idea too. And it very much goes against the typical thought of fire ants in that they really like disturbance, but what happens if they're infected with the virus when disturbance occurs? So just another question to walk away from. So next. This is our epidemic disease outcome virus. This is the one that really is not nice to our, our little fire ant friends. So, they really, they don't like it. <laughs> they die. <laughs> so these are, it's interesting because these, these areas that I was studying have a relatively, like it's pretty easy to find. It usually takes you about two hours to find um, enough fire colonies that fit with what I'm, I'm looking for. And, there is just not very high prevalence of 
my epidemic disease outcome, Solenopsis infective virus 3 here, except it militated, which is cool because this is the only place that nobody lives on. So that's kind of an interesting, you know, again, it's just an observation. It's not something that has any real data attached to it, but the Millican Reserve is a wildlife <coughs> reserve. And so there's not a whole lot going on in there as far as people and disturbance. So what this data suggests to me, and this is again, completely conjecture and part of my dissertation in this chapter is going to be to look at the ecological aspects of these areas and start to equate this data with ecological disturbance or lack thereof. But the Millican Reserve is the only one that doesn't have much in the way of disturbance going on. There's not people there tromping around out there. So does that say, the, the next question is, does that say that disturbance is what it takes for Invictivirus 3 to cause mortality, right? So looking ahead, I know that leaves a whole lot of questions. It does for me too. That's why I'm working on a PhD in it. <laughs> for me to say that there is not a magic bullet for fire ants, we're not going to kill them with one specific thing. And it's really fun to see <laughs> entomologists getting creative and trying to find new ways to kill them, especially with stuff like fire and decapitating boards. Like, how alien is that? But so there's not a magic bullet, unfortunately. But Solanopsis convicted viruses are really promising contenders because all we have to do is stress them out to kill them. That's what it looks like, which is really cool. But it'd be kind of fun to stress out fire ants for the rest of my life. Um, but so before Invictus viruses can be incorporated into current control efforts, there really is a lot that has to be learned about them before we can just deploy a virus out into the world and say, go for it and kill fire ants. So understanding seasonal and geographic variation will provide some really crucial information into developing a control plan for fire ants that specifically involves these exceptionally targeted natural enemies that look like they do some pretty good damage. Like they look like they do some pretty pretty good work as far as controlling these guys. So that is my 10 minute spiel on my dissertation. And with that, I will take any questions. Oh, that was quick, what's up? <laughs> well, I might've missed this, but how do you, how do you uh, is this a naturally occurring virus or is this something that? Yeah, so okay? sorry, again, this was a 10 minute talk from a, a conference where they really had me hammer through it. Um, but yeah, so it is a naturally occurring virus, naturally occurring in that it is um, endemic in the areas that fire ants naturally occur, so specifically Argentina. But so part of the biology that I kind of didn't go into because this was a talk at an entomology society meeting at a fire ant <laughs> forum, so everybody already knew this. Um, but so a, a really big part of fire ants and their ecology and the way that um, their introduction has kind of gone, gone ahead is that they were only introduced at one location in Mobile, Alabama between 1910 and 1930, depending on the US. So what that means is that the fact that I find these viruses in Texas says that from that original introduction, unless we're missing something, that these viruses came over with them. And so this natural enemy that's really crucial to controlling fire ants in Argentina has come over with them. So that's a really promising, again, that's a really promising idea as far as their control because these viruses are instrumental in their native lands in controlling them. So did that cover that? That was kind of a ramble. If well, I've got a follow-up. If it okay. does, if it does work and, and controls them, how would you is there a way to you go spread the virus more or what? You know, yeah, it so it's a surprisingly stable virus. Um, you know, RNA viruses are notorious for um, being easily degraded, but on the other hand of that, they're tougher than you think. So some of the work that's being done by um, another researcher who's in Gainesville, Florida and works with USDA is working on uh, developing a capsid, so a little bait formulation that kind of looks like an amdro, like a pellet, or using it as a bait, but it's virus instead of toxin. Kind of red. Yes. How far north are those boogers migrating? Uh, they're not in New Mexico. So they are not in New Mexico. So Arkansas, Texas, uh, California, Florida. So I guess New Mexico is probably the highest that they would be. I, my my geography is kind of depressingly bad. <laughs> so if I had a map, I could probably tell you because I know where they're not. Yes. 
when you did the, the drone lady mm -hmm. for the fire ants, is the virus most specific to the ant or can it cross over into some other candy? No, so that's that is the really, really <laughs> cool thing about viruses and specifically the family salinvaviridae and all of these uh dicastaviridae and salinvaviridae are the two families of very similar viruses. So they are extremely host specific. There was actually a study that was done in, I believe it was 2014, where the researchers who worked on it um, exposed very, very closely related fires, specifically fire ants. We have Solenopsis richteri, we have richteri, and um, the black imported fire ant, which is really cool. So, at least I think it's really cool. <laughs> but I'm good. Yeah. Early on in the presentation, you said that there was a lab test. One of the fire consumers was at 150. Yes, pseudomonas. And went out in the field with it. Yeah. Was there any kind of hypothesis of why in the field or not? Yeah, so the thing with, um, to kind of loop it back to something that is maybe a little bit more approachable is Ebola virus. So let's let's just think about this in terms of Ebola virus. So viruses have to, pathogens in general, have to be smart about how they infect their hosts. If something like Ebola virus, there was originally one outbreak of Ebola virus near the Ebola River in Africa, which is what it was named for, that had exceptionally high mortality. So the rate of um, individuals who become ill as a result of exposure and then die from it. So that particular strain of Ebola virus never really got anywhere because it killed everybody. It had like 98% mortality because it killed everybody. It killed all hosts. And so what happens a lot of times with these very high, as in this case, pseudomonas, very high mortality pathogens are not very good pathogens because they kill everybody they touch before they get the chance to spread. So that is typically the fine line of, and that's another deal that's really going to be when this this project gets into more applied areas, that's gonna be the really big challenge is we have to make it toxic, but the whole point of this is viruses are very host specific and they're infectious. So that means that they can go from one host to another without us having to mess with them. Otherwise, Amdro is perfectly effective. So, you know, the, anyway, looping back to Ebola, it's probably because just like Ebola, Pseudomonas had very high mortality. High mortality means low transmission because everybody died before they got the chance to share it with their friends. So. Questions, questions. Right. How do you how do you pick your spots, your your locations for doing that? So I didn't exactly get to pick them. Um, I am a part of a really cool program called EcoLab that. Um, it's a group of attorneys and landowners who work together for the purpose of um, doing ecological research for um, conservation status. And so I was given access, with the exception of Millican Reserve, because Millican Reserve, I know the manager of the property very well, um, but the properties that I picked were offered to me through the Ecolab management system as you can come out here and do science on private properties, which is cool because that means that they're generally not messed with their foot traffic is relatively low so that was kind of the, the big reason for selecting them is access to private properties they're big properties through 35 ish acres so it's a lot of land for me to collect fire ants on and um that i know who comes in and out of them and they didn't do it so <laughs> yeah. have you figured out how to do your collections without getting bit all the you know it is actually not that hard i mean i have let me tell you, there's a learning curve. I will never be a hand model based on the number of fire <laughs> scars that I have. Um, but so I take a, I wear a, a palpation glove. Like if you're ever been around veterinary medicine, it's the glove that goes all the way up your elbow for doing gross things. Um, but I use a palpation glove and take a 50 milliliter scintillation tube. So it's just like a, it's like a little conical tube. And I stick it into the center of the collie and the mound, and the ants fall into it. And then I pop it back out and screw a cap on it, and I don't get stung very much. <laughs> so that's how I do it. Is that it? Oh, One really? Fun. How how many uh, insects and animals do you do you uh, have at your house, and which one's your favorite? 
Oh, why did you ask me that? Um, okay, let's let's go through the list. Two horses. They are not the favorites. I've got cooler stuff than that. Two horses, two cats. I'm not gonna lie, my cat Beans is she's pretty cool. <laughs> Beans is pretty awesome. Um, 22 tarantulas and a scorpion, and I've got some goldfish. The scorpion's pretty rad. <laughs> I like the scorpion. <laughs> Is that all you got for me? All right. Now you can talk to me. I bet you're going to get a medal. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh, do I get a medal? Yeah! Because <laughs> we all want to commemorate 2020, because that was such a trip. <laughs> Renee, thank you so much for coming to speak to us. And uh, as a thank you, we'd like to give you Boulder Spices. Yes. Own operated for your next yes. cookout. And please invite us all. And also yeah. the new 100-year anniversary Aggie Park shirts that are for sale over here. This is yours. And uh, nice. I want to leave you with one other, one other thing. Um, there's been an ant on my desk since last week, and I think it might be permanent. You get it? Okay. I hate you. Okay. <laughs> I hate you. Oh, also, feel free to take a look at my other hazards. I don't get hazard pay as a graduate student. That, by the way, I can't see him. That's a freaking cotton mouth. That was the fire at Conley I was collecting. That's a cotton mouth. <laughs> Just. You're welcome for my work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Renee. We really appreciate it. Right, let's give her one more hand. Safe travels back to College Station. And uh, next week, what do we have next week? Mr. Pfeiffer, you're up next week. So bring a friend and let's come hear some good old stories. Thank you all. Gig them. Dude, I'm so excited about <laughs>